assistant to the athletic director at LSU. He's coach baseball, assistant coach of baseball at, at LSU. He is a member of the Denham Springs Pentecostal Church, Brother Ray Johnson. Brother Johnson taught him a Bible study, and it changed his life, and we're very glad to have him with us tonight. Brother Trapani, we're also glad to have you here with us. He's doing our counseling this session. We're glad you're here. Brother Bailey, come up and share your heart with us. Would you stand and welcome him? We're very glad to have him with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Let's give that hand clap of praise unto the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Brother Mangan, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak at your, at your church. When you're looking for examples of how it's supposed to be done, this is the church that most Pentecostal churches look to. This is how it's done. They're first in everything. And we're very fortunate to have an opportunity to be here tonight, and I want to make sure that he understands exactly how much I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Before I get started, I need to introduce the guest who came with me. While I was at LSU for 15 years, I was fortunate enough to be part of five national championship teams there. And it's an amazing thing, my wife of 32 years has one thing published and now I'm known as Sister Lydia's husband. <laughs> so it really doesn't make any difference if you got five national championship rings. But I want to introduce my wife, Lydia. Honey, would you stand? Let me tell you basically how this came about. I was called to speak to our summer camp staff at the campgrounds at Tioga. And I went to do a teamwork seminar for them. And when I got through, Greg Albritton said, have you got <laughs> July 26th open? And I went, what? He says, I want to do the same thing, and I want to do it again. And I went, we training these folks again? I didn't do such a good job the, the first time. He said, no. He said, we're going to do this at the senior camp. So I went and spoke at the senior camp, and I talked about leadership. I talked about teamwork. And it wasn't too much longer after that that Brother Mangan called and asked me if I would come and do a similar seminar for you, at which... Uh, if I would have had something booked on this night, to be totally honest with you, I would have rearranged it because I think that's such a tremendous opportunity. So I'm glad to be here to talk to you about teamwork, learning to play together, developing the mindset of one. I want to start off with this premise. Today, somebody today is going to tell you something that's going to be the most important thing you'll ever hear in your entire life. I have no idea when it's going to be said. I can only hope that at the exact moment that it's said that you happen to be listening. It's an incredible thing. The greatest group of athletes ever accumulated on our campus in any sport. We have 20 sports at LSU. We have 11 women's sports and 9 men's sports. And in the rich history that we've had at LSU, of those 20 sports, the greatest accumulation of physical talent ever to walk on that campus was not there in 1958 when Billy Cannon and that crew won a national championship in football. The greatest accumulation of talent ever in the history of, of that entire university wasn't there in 1991, 1993, 
1996, 1997, or 2000 when we won five national championships in baseball. The greatest accumulation of talent ever assembled on that campus was there in 1987 when we should have won our first national championship in baseball. But we had to wait till 1991 because we had a distraction. You see, it doesn't make any difference about your physical ability. It doesn't make a difference about your God-given tools. What it boils down to is this. Can you focus? Can you concentrate? And how easily do you eliminate distractions? It has nothing to do with your talent. There were nine kids... Nine kids on that one LSU baseball team in 1987 that made it to the big leagues. And not one of those kids has a national championship ring. It has nothing to do with talent. Something was missing. How easily are you distracted? They played the College World Series for 55 years. And in 55 years, the number one team in the country in 55 years, the number one team in the country going into the College World Series has only won the national championship in 55 years. Once. It's got nothing to do with your talent. What it has to do with is can you focus? Can you concentrate? And how easily are you distracted? You want distractions? You ought to go to Omaha. When you fly in immediately, every single sports manufacturer in the world is there. You got to bring an empty suitcase just to bring all the stuff home with you that you're going to get free. You're going to get brand new bats, you're going to get brand new gloves, you're going to get brand new hats, you're going to get brand new warm-ups, you're going to get brand new running shoes, you're going to get brand new spikes, you're going to get all kind of sweatsuits. And the list is endless. And if they can find out, if you're the starting pitcher, they want your hotel room number. I've had to run manufacturers out of our kids' rooms at the embassy suites. A 30-second commercial at the College World Series will cost you $550,000 for 30 seconds. But yet if that guy can get his glove on your hand and that home plate camera can catch that guy on the mound, he's going to get free advertisement the entire game. And he will bother you the entire time that you are up there. It has nothing to do with your talent. What it has to do with is, can you eliminate distractions? Can you remember what the task is at hand? Can you remember why you went there? 1991, the number one team in the country was from Florida State. They had an awesome club. But I guess they got caught up in the fact that you got to do this interview with ESPN, you got to do this interview with CBS. You got to do all these radio broadcasts because everybody has a radio station. I guess maybe they got caught up with the fact that while you're there, you have to go to the zoo because the world's second largest zoo happens to be there and you take your kids. Omaha is known for steak. One of the nights that we're there, we shut down a steakhouse. We bring every single player, their date, their parents, and all of our booster club members to a steakhouse, and we feed everyone. And there's entertainment during the course of the week, and it's within walking distance. There is one distraction after another. You are going to be there for 10 days and only play four games. Can you stay focused? Can you stay in a state of concentration? And how well do you take the distractions and put them behind you? 
Florida State played two games. They lost two games. They went back to Tallahassee, Florida, and the number four team in the country won the national championship. Why? Because it's got nothing to do with your talent level. What it has to do with is, can you focus, can you concentrate, can you pay attention, and how easily do you eliminate distractions? Hello, church. I'm talking to you. In 1993, the number one team in the country was the best talent we would ever line up against. We were going to line up to play against Arizona State. Arizona State had a slight distraction. The man who is a legend in our profession, a guy by the name of Jim Brock, was the head coach at Arizona State. He was dying of cancer. The second day he was in Omaha, they took a special plane and flew him back to Arizona, where two days later, he died. Arizona State played two games. They lost two games. They went back to Tempe, Arizona. And the number four team in the nation won a national championship because it's got nothing to do with your talent. Can you focus? Can you concentrate? Can you eliminate distractions? I'm so glad to be in the house of God tonight. It's not even funny. I came in off the street, and I'll tell you what. I'm so glad to be here because the world, I love to get away from it, and my sanctuary is right in this place. There is nothing like being in God's house or being with God's people. I had enough of the world for 52 years. Five years ago, everything turned around for me. All of a sudden, I wasn't distracted by the world anymore. All of a sudden, I found out there were other things besides the baseball. And I found out that one of the most important things that I would ever do in my entire life would be to make a decision on where I wanted to spend eternity. My wife, we had just finished the weekend camp at LSU. And she called during the course of that weekend and she said, I know it's a hectic weekend because the weekends are very hectic but from the standpoint of coaches being in town and we stay up 24 hours X and O and talking what we do and listening to what they do. Shaking hands, kissing babies. But she said, when you get home, there's two things I'd like to do. She said, the first thing is I'd like to maybe go over and, and hear uh, the First Baptist Church is having their, their, their the, the Livingston Parish Youth Choir is going to do their Christmas concert. She said, I'd like to go hear them. I said, we'll do it. She said, then later on that night, about 6.30, she said, Brother Johnson is teaching a, a subject on revelations and what it means to the Middle East. That was five years ago. And I said, man, I'd like to hear that. We went to that service, and when we got through with that service, I didn't know there were that many people in that church. They kind of hemmed us in. But they blocked the aisles. I shook hands and talked for about 45 minutes, and I looked up, and 80% of the church was still there. I turned to my wife, unknowing that this would happen to me. I turned to her, and I said, these people got no life. They're still here. Little did I know. <laughs> it wouldn't be long. I'd be in that church for five years. The message that he delivered really weighed on me heavily. And I called an individual who invited me to church. Woo, listen to that. Invited me to church. How tough is that? Just invite somebody to church. 
And I said, listen, I understand you guys have a television and also a, uh, an audio tape ministry. I said, I- I've made a decision. I'm supposed to be speaking in the Panhandle on Friday night, and then I'm speaking in Birmingham on Saturday night, and I'm coming back. And I've decided I'm, I'm, I'm going to cancel the plane reservations. There's too much downtime and those little small airports. I'm just going to drive. And I said, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Can you get me that tape of the service Sunday night? He said, oh, yeah. He said, I imagine they probably got a copy hanging around somewhere. I put that tape in. I listened to it all the way to Pensacola, Florida. I spoke Friday night. I got in that vehicle. I drove all the way to Birmingham, Alabama. I listened to it all the way to Birmingham, Alabama. I got from Birmingham, Alabama and drove back to Denham Springs, Louisiana. I listened to it all the way. I got home. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. My wife was still up. I walked in the door and I said, we found it. I finally found somebody that will tell me the truth. Thank God for the truth. For 52 years, I played church. Now I'm in church. There's a major difference. 1996, we win our third national championship. And as professional baseball likes to do us, they take everybody. They leave, leave, they leave two kids. They leave a kid that I had gotten out of Nacogdoches, Texas, by the name of Eddie Furnest, who was our first baseman, and he would be the National College Player of the Year the next year. They leave a kid that I had gotten out of Turnersville, New Jersey, a kid by the name of Michael Kerner. He would be the Gatorade National College Player of the Year the following year. They took everybody else. They took our catcher. They took our second baseman. They took our shortstop. They took our third baseman. They took our left fielder. They took our right fielder. They took our Tuesday starter. They took our Wednesday starter. They took our Friday starter. They took our Saturday starter. They took our Sunday starter. They took the first three guys out of the bullpen, and they took our closer. They signed 15 kids off that one club. But you know something? When you have the ability to focus and concentrate and pay attention and eliminate distractions, guess what? In 1997, we won our fourth national championship. It didn't make a difference how many people they took. It's not about your talent level. It's about whether you're paying attention or not because the information is given to you every single day it's given. I wish I could tell you at 3 o'clock this afternoon, shut everything down because why you woke up this morning, it's going to be given to you at 3 o'clock. But I don't know that to be a fact. I wish I could tell you what time it's going to happen. All I know is the good ones get it and the bad ones don't. I can't tell you the number of times in 15 years working for Coach Berkman that I walked into a ballpark and I went in to see a kid that we were supposed to sign and to be totally honest with you, that guy couldn't play dead for us. But buddy, you should have seen this other guy. I'm in Alexandria, Louisiana, sitting in a ballpark at Bolton High School. They sent me to see some guy play. They had so much bad misinformation on this guy, okay? I didn't really know which one he was. But I'm going to tell you one thing, pal. They had a second baseman over there that could play. And I'm looking through the stands going, you could shoot a shot through here and not hit anybody. Where is everybody? This guy is a player. This guy had no scholarship offers. But yet Warren Morris was a four-time All-American at LSU and a four-time academic All-American because what I saw was a kid who could focus, who could concentrate, who could pay attention, who could eliminate distractions. And because of that and because of his mental capabilities, that kid was going to be a great player. The shortstop on that club was a kid I'd gotten out of Santa Maria, Louisiana. He was about five foot four, 
on a good day with some sunlight and water. Looked like a human manhole covered with hair. I told him when I recruited him, I really didn't like him as a player. I just needed to have somebody to talk to. I got tired of talking to the belly button and all them other guys. Hey, pal, tell this guy up here. Jason Williams was a four-time All-American, and just like Warren Morris, he was a four-time academic All-American. You couldn't have stacked those two guys on top of each other and got eight feet. We lose a four-time All-American at shortstop, and I have to go out and find some, some replacement. I go to Louisville, Kentucky, and I find a kid six foot three, weighs about 195 pounds. I'm talking about makes the tough plays look easy, had a cannon for an arm, switch it with power, and if you want to make some money, be recruited by me. Buddy, I can get you drafted. All I got to do is find out I'm on you. He's the sixth pick in the first round. He signs for $1.5 million. I immediately come back with my counteroffer of five more meals in Broussard Hall. Doesn't seem to work. <laughs> now I've lost a four-time All-American. Now I've lost a kid that was drafted in the first round, and I'm scratching my head thinking, now what are you going to do, pal? And I remembered a kid at Blinn Community College in Texas. And I remembered when I shook that kid's hand how he liked to broke every finger on my hand. I can remember shaking hands with that kid and I can remember that kid looking me straight in the face. You see, I've got this fetish. You don't understand, but communication, guys, is 80% visual. You don't have to open your mouth and people know where you go to church. I remember the fact of how intent he was about what he did. But I was going to have a small problem. I was going to have to go in and tell Coach Bertman that I was replacing a four-time All-American and a first-round draft choice who was replacing him with a guy who was drafted in the 42nd round. You could have heard that conversation at the bell tower. Now, I'm not saying Coach Berkman's very good at chewing on body parts. I'll just tell you this much. I used to be six foot four. You go figure. <laughs> I remember him screaming at me, and he said, Are you nuts? What makes you think this guy that's drafted in the 42nd round is the answer to a fourth national championship? Good question. I said, Coach, let me tell you something. I think this kid's got the same physical tools as the two kids we lost. But let me tell you something. I think he's dumb as a box of rocks. And it's not because the kid's not intellectual. This kid's on the dean's list. His problem is, ready? He doesn't know. Oh, hello, church. He doesn't know. I said, given the information, I'm telling you right now, this guy could be incredible. Oh, I got that you better be right speech. I'm sitting in the embassy suites. It's June 1997. A door opens on the fifth floor, and out walks a kid who 11 months earlier had been drafted in the 42nd round. You see, walking out of that door to the elevator, was a kid who was the 16th pick in the first round. You see, getting on that glass elevator to come downstairs wasn't a kid who signed for $85,000 as the New York Yankees tried to make him do. 
he had a little bit of information and he realized that was no money. And he had called me and he said, Coach, I'm going to come and at least get another year of my education. I'll be that much closer to my degree. You see, that's a mainstay with us. You can come and win a national championship, but let me tell you what else you're going to do while you're there. You're going to class. Getting on that glass elevator is a kid who signed for $1.33 million. Coming down that elevator wasn't a kid that hit 13 home runs in two years like he did in junior college. Coming down that elevator was a kid who hit 40 home runs for us in five months. I told you he didn't have the information. You know what the holdup is with some so-called Christians? They don't have the information. Thank God for pulpits like this one where truth is preached and what they tell you is exactly what the book says. I watched as he got off that elevator and he walked over to the buffet line. We had a practice at 9 o'clock. And the kids were getting, getting their breakfast and hurrying up and getting to the bus. Now, you've got to understand something. When we, first went to, when we first went to Omaha in the early 80s, we had the run of the place. There's nobody there. It was awesome. Now, our fans are everywhere. You can't get off the bus to get in the hotel. You can't get on the bus to go to practice, okay? You can't have a team meal. You can't have a team meeting. They don't understand. This is a business trip for us. We are there for a certain purpose. I had my stopwatch in my pocket, and I started my stopwatch as that kid left that elevator door and walked 80 feet. 35 minutes later, he got there. And I watched as he picked his tray up and some woman touched him on his shoulder. And he turned around and she was standing there with four dozen baseballs for him to sign. He put his tray down. He turned around. He sat at a little small table right there. He signed 48 baseballs. He put the tops back on the four boxes. And he turned to the lady and thanked her for being an LSU fan and for coming to the College World Series. And he promised her that we would do everything we possibly could to win the national championship. You see, Brandon Larson knew why we were there. We were there to win it all, and he refused to be distracted. We miss information all the time because we allow the world to distract us. If you're going to be a teammate of mine, the first thing you better understand is this. I don't care about your ability. The first thing I care about is will you pay, uh, pay attention as much as I will so that we might be able to get this job done. Because what I don't want is some failure because we didn't get the information. Every single team meeting we have at LSU starts the same way. This may be the only time you hear this, so get it now. Every single meeting for 15 years started the same way. This may be the only time you hear this, so get it now. It was the fall of 1990. I just finished working our offense out and I Walked down to the bullpen area down in right field because Coach Bergman was working out a senior left-handed pitcher that I had brought in from Southington, Connecticut, a kid by the name of Mark LaRosa. And I walked down because my boss is the best in my business. Nobody at any level is better than he is. You know, my, my, my oldest daughter taught me something the other night. 
just in passing, she said, Hey, Dad, you know, you know the word listen? I said, yeah. When you rearrange those same six letters, it spells silent. I walked down to that bullpen, and buddy, let me tell you something. Woo! He said something in that bullpen workout I have never forgotten. I walked down to that bullpen, and the first pitch that senior left-handed pitcher threw, he threw it, and he bounced it at about 55 feet. It came up and hit the catcher in the throat. Second pitch he threw, he threw it up on the chain link fence behind the catcher. So it went for about five more pitches. And I'm standing there thinking to myself, I wonder what the old man's going to do. This ought to be really interesting. I like need, need 17 notebooks, 19 cameras. I got to get this down. Pal, when I become a head coach, I'm going to do the same thing because this, this is a spot in history here where I'm going to always remember what happens. He walked up to that senior left-handed pitcher, and so help me. He made one small minor adjustment in that kid's arm slot as he brought the ball to the front. He made one small minor adjustment, and that kid threw the ball in the catcher's mitt Ten times in a row, exactly where that guy held his mitt. He threw the ball right there. You could have caught him with a pair of tweezers. Now, I'm standing behind La Rosa, so he's got to get the ball turned around when he walks back to the mound, and he's got to be facing me. I've been in the game 52 years. I have never seen a look like that on anybody's face. He turned around, and it was one of those... Where'd that come from? And he turned around and he asked Coach Bertman this question. What a great question. He turned around to Coach Bertman and he said, Hey, Coach, why didn't you, uh, why didn't you tell me this uh, four years ago? And Coach Bertman said the same thing parents say. He said the same thing teachers say. He said the same thing that employers say to their employees. He said, and I quote, I did. You just weren't listening. How many times does it have to be said to you before you're going to get it? Time is running out. We are in a desperate situation in this world today. It's not one of these situations, well, I can wait till so-and-so and I'll get the information then. You may be sorry you did that. Today, somebody today is going to say something that's going to be the most important thing you will ever hear in your life. It has happened to me for 57 years, every day. I have no idea when it's coming. It may be the only time in my entire lifetime that I have an opportunity to hear it. The only thing I can hope for us is at that exact moment, I hear it for the one and only time I need to hear it. God, unstop my ears. I was speaking at First Church in Baton Rouge not too long ago. And I was speaking to one of their men retreats. And the topic I was speaking on was Everything I needed to know about life, I learned from Noah's Ark. And one of the first things I mentioned was, don't miss the boat. I got news for you, friend. There's another boat coming. It's coming soon. And let me tell you something. It's not the ark of your choice. 
You can't stand on the bank and say, I'll wait on the next one. You either get on this ark, pal, or you're going to regret it for however long you stay on this earth. Me, I choose to be called away. Yes, sir. If you're going to be a teammate of mine, we have to understand there is no individual goals. Individual goals hasn't won, ever won a championship. It's about team goals. You want to surround yourself with people? Surround them with people who this thing right here means everything in the world to them. You surround yourself by these folks. I've been in the other places, guys. I'm singing a different song. I'm dancing a different dance. I'm drinking from a different fountain. It's not the same for me as it used to be. And I will never, ever go back. It's June 23rd, 1876. It's the Montana Territory. There's a large fort. And the commander of that fort is a guy by the name of General Alfred Terry. And General Terry makes a decision that he wants to round up all of the Sioux Indians. He calls into his office a guy who will go down in history forever. George Armstrong Custer. He calls Custer into his office and he says, listen, I want you to leave this afternoon. I want you to take the 7th Calvary, which at that time was the most decorated Calvary in the history of the United States Army. He said, I want you to take all 650 men. I want you to go to the Black Hills of the Dakotas. And when you get there, I want you to send your advanced scouts out. And when your advanced scouts come back, if they tell you there's a thousand Indians or less, you have 650 men, you got modern weaponry, round the Indians up and bring them to the reservation. But I guess like some folks, he didn't hear this next part. See, that the, the exact moment, say, that you make a decision to turn and talk to your friend, that's the way life works. That's the moment the information's given. Just when you're not paying attention. And he didn't hear. But if there's more than a thousand Indians, wait for me. I will be there June 27th with reinforcements. The afternoon of June 23rd, he left. They went to the Black Hills of the Dakotas. They got there. He sent out his advance scouts. And on the morning of June 25th, 1876, all the advance scouts came back. And every single scout to the man told Custer there was more than 1,000 Indians. He calls his favorite scout aside, a Sioux Indian by the name of Bloody Knife. He calls him aside and he says, what'd you see? He said, sir, it's the largest Indian village I've ever seen on the plains. There's as many as 4,000 Indians, uh, warriors, there may be as many as 10,000 Indians. I don't know why he does this. Here's a guy who's M.O., was to sneak up on a village at dawn. And while the Indians slept, right at the crack of dawn, they would attack. That was Custer's M.O. But at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on June 25th, 1876, he makes a decision to round up the Sioux Indians. He sends Major Reno up one side the Little Bighorn River. 
He sends Captain Benteen up the other side of the Little Bighorn River, and he goes north to where he thinks there's a weak point in the village. But I guess he turned to talk to his friend when the scouts told him that the village ran for three miles. He didn't hear that. And he came out right in the middle of the village. In less than an hour, or one Indian observer noted, in less time than it takes a hungry man to eat his lunch, 271 men were killed, including Custer. I have one simple question. Why didn't he wait? Why didn't he wait? Why didn't he wait just two more days? The reinforcements were coming. He told them on the 27th, I'll be there to help you. Custer had a hidden agenda. You can't have teammates that have a hidden agenda. The number one goal is the goal of the teams. You see, in May of 1876, Custer wrote his wife and told her when he got back from the Montana Territory in August of 1876, he would declare his candidacy for the presidency of the United States of America. That sucker sold out 270 other people because he had a goal that was more important to him than the goal of the team. It's not about your will. It's about God's will. It's about what he wants. It's not about or never has been about what you want. God, I want to evangelize. You know what he told me? I want you to teach Bible studies. Do you know why he's the pastor at this church? It's not because he's related to his father who was the pastor of this church prior to him. He's here because of one thing. God called him. That's why he's here. You want to know what's wrong with these things in this country? I'll tell you what's wrong. What's wrong is people standing behind these things that aren't anointed and called by God. That was free. It's not about your will. You want to be a teammate? It's about the team's will. It's about God's will. What does he want you to do in your life? There's a ceremony that takes place at our place. It don't mean a whole lot to you. It means a great deal to me. Every single, every single time a new team shows up at LSU in August, there's a team meeting that takes place. And at that team meeting, every new person that becomes part of our organization, new player, new manager, new trainer, new secretary, assistant coach that took my place when I moved up as an assistant to our athletic director. Every single one of those people are given something very special. Every single one of those people are given a crystal baseball. I've had mine for 15 years. I've packed this thing for 15 years. Everything that we're about is right here. Hello, church. Everything that we are about is right here. The most important ingredient inside this ball is something you can't find in this country anymore. Trust. Can I trust you? 
You see, what I don't need is somebody in some selfish moment when they think more of themselves than they do their teammates and they allow this thing to drop and crash into a million pieces. Let me tell you what you got, friend. What you've got is a situation that can't be put back together. Because I can't trust you. In a Jewish wedding, when a man and a woman get married, they wrap up a crystal glass in a cloth, and they place that crystal glass underneath that groom's foot, and at a specified moment, he crashes that thing into a million pieces, and the rabbi reminds the bride and groom how fragile that relationship is built on one thing and one thing only. Can I trust you? You want to be a teammate of mine? There better be an honor of trust. I packed this ball for every guy that's ever played there. I packed that ball for every guy that's there now. I packed this ball for guys I don't even know that are coming. And it says, I will never do anything to bring you down. You can trust me. Why? Because I'm going to represent you the way you should be represented. You know, we do one thing in the church house and then we get out on the street and we do something else. That's not a crystal ball, that's a rubber ball. What they ought to see is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what they ought to see. I tell every single kid that writes me or calls me, don't send me your stats, I'm not interested in them. That's the most inflated baloney I've ever seen in my entire life. You want to catch my attention? Here's what I want you to do. Show me that you can do something as a member of a team. You catch my attention that way. I've never known an individual to win a team championship. Fall of 1990, we having a, our player conferences. We probably meet with more, about, more, more with our players than anybody in the country. That's the way we keep our thumb on the pulse of our club, and there are no surprises. You see, I'm not going to jail on Saturday night to get you out. You can play somewhere else. The reputation of our university, the reputation of our athletic department, and the reputation of our baseball team means something to me. And you're not going to discard that. I called a kid into my office. He was an All-American the year before. If you'd opened up his shirt, tattooed on his chest probably was the largest eye you've ever seen. That guy could care less about anybody else in purple and gold. He hit 385. He hit 17 home runs. And he was the biggest me I have ever seen. I can remember calling him in before the Christmas holidays. And I can remember bringing him in, into my office. And I can remember saying, buddy, I got this premonition. We're not bad. Now, let me tell you how we got to pull this off. You got to do everything Coach Burtman tells you to do. You got to stop playing for yourself, and you got to play for the rest of us. Listen to me. I don't want you to hit 17 home runs. Why don't you hit 12? I don't want you to hit 385. Why don't you hit somewhere between 310 and 320, but just do everything we ask you to do. If you'll just do that, we might have a chance. It's amazing how God works things out. I'm standing on the infield at Rosenblatt Stadium. They're handing us the national championship trophy. And standing right next to me was Rich Cordani. It's amazing we won a national championship. It is incredible he hit 317. There's a sign that I took down in my office after 33 years in this profession. It's the only sign I've allowed in my office. 
and it simply says this. It's amazing what can be accomplished when no one cares who gets the credit. It's about giving God the glory. It ain't about you having the glory. It's about giving the glory to God. January of 1991, Coach Bertman walked into our team meeting room, and he walked in with this length of rope. We have a podium, something similar to this, in our team meeting area. And he walked in dragging this piece of rope. Now, we didn't have a real good fall, so I wasn't really sure what Coach Bertman was going to do with that rope. He walked up to that podium, and he hung it over that podium. And he turned to our players, and he said, I want to put you in this scenario. You've fallen off a cliff. You're holding on for dear life. There's a 300-foot drop below you, and suddenly, out of nowhere, someone lowers you a rope. He said, I want to know something. Now, this is just going to stay in this room, but, but I want to know something. What I want to know is this. Who in this room, just this room, who in this room would you want on the other end of that rope if your life depended on it? Who would you want on the other end of that rope knowing that no matter how much their hands tired, no matter how much their hands bled, they would never, ever let go of that rope because they were a teammate of yours and they honest to God loved you. Who would you want? He turned over here to his right and he said, John, who do you want? John said, I want Bill. Bill, who do you want? I want Frank. Frank, who do you want? Tom, Tom, who do you want? I want Larry. And that's the way it went around the room. And he turned to our now head coach, Smoke Lavelle, and he said, Smoke, who do you want? And Smoke said, well, I want so-and-so. And he turned to me and he said, Beetle, who do you want? I said, well, let me have so-and-so. And when we got through, he turned to us and he said, till it makes no difference who's on the other end of this rope, we have no team. The national championship game in 1991, there was a kid on the mound that I had the pleasure of recruiting. What a beautiful kid. And I'm proud to say he's a Christian. kid I got out of Lake Charles, Louisiana from St. Louis High School, a kid by the name of Chad OJ. He's pitched his heart out. It's the seventh inning. LSU has six. Wichita State has three. But we're in serious trouble. Wichita State has runners at first and second. There's nobody out. And Coach Bertman has to make a change. And he went to the mound. And he said, OJ, you did well, man. We got to make a move. And he turned around and he signaled to the bullpen. And in from the bullpen came this six foot four kid that I had gotten out of Miami, Florida by the name of Rick Green. Now you have to understand something. I love Green. While I was on my recruiting trip down there, he stole my hubcaps. <laughs> the best part about it was the car was moving. This guy was good. I'm kidding. Rick Green walks into the mound. I didn't know this until one of our Booster Club members mentioned it to me. And he walked to the mound, and Chad OJ took the ball out of his glove, and he stuck it in Rick Green's glove. And as I re-round, rewound my video to the exchange on the mound, Chad OJ looked at Rick Green and he said, Hey, buddy, it's time to hold that rope. 
My question for you in closing is very simple. Who's holding your rope? Is there someone on the other end who is whirly and you can't trust? Or is there someone on the other end of that rope who gives you everlasting life? But let me ask you a more important question. Whose rope are you holding? Who can count on you? On the side of our 1991 National Championship rings, I had the pleasure of designing every ring that we got within 15 years. On the side of that 1991 National Championship ring is a raised ribbon, and inside that ribbon it says this, hold the rope. In conclusion, I was preparing for a speech at a convention not too long ago. And in my research, I ran across this. And I want to share this with you. Because the greatest team ever accumulated were the people that God put on this earth. As I read this poem, I began to weep. And I kept saying, this is us. This is us. This is where we are right now in life. The story is intertwined in a small size plane crashing and there only being six people left and in order to make it they have to do one thing and one thing only count on each other the poem is called the coal within Six humans trapped by happenstance in black and bitter cold. Each one possessed a stick of wood, or so the story is told. Their dying fire in need of logs, the first man held his back, for on the faces around the fire he noticed one was black the second man looking across the way saw one not of his church and couldn't bring himself to give the fire his stick of birch the third man sat in tattered clothes he gave his coat a hitch why should his log be put to use to warm the idle rich. The rich man just sat back and thought of all the wealth he had in store and how he could save what he had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. And the black man's face bespoke revenge as the fire fell from his sight for all he saw in his stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. And the last man of that forlorn group did not accept for gain, giving only to those who gave was how he played the game. Logs held tight in death still hands was proof of human sin. They didn't die from the coal without. They died from the coal within.
July of this year, to be honest with you, Tuesday night, I had to introduce my pastor's wife. And at the conclusion of that service, for the first time since July, I told this story. I stood over the casket of a 21-year-old that played for us. There was an autopsy done. It was a mysterious death. And the autopsy revealed that he had an enlarged heart and he had enlarged arteries within his heart. In the few moments that I had an opportunity to stand over Wally Pontiff's lifeless body, I didn't think about the thing that he had a national championship ring. I didn't think about he was an All-American. I didn't think about the fact that every time I would mention the phrase LSU baseball, I would think of him because he was the example. As I stood over that body, the song came to me that my pastor sings. And it simply says this. You never mentioned Jesus to me. It says you passed me by each day and you knew I was astray. And you never mentioned Jesus to me. Christ is soon to come for his church. I certainly want to make sure that I'm aboard. But I want you to go with me. I hope in some small way in the last hour (laughs) I hope I have provoked you to think. If you don't know What this book says, there's still time. It's not long, but there's still time. Thank you, guys. God bless you. important as we as leaders we hear what the man told us tonight we're the leaders of this church thousands in this congregation are on the other end of the rope what we do determines what we do in this community and in this state and around the world 
And I pray tonight that what Brother Bailey spoke into our heart and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that you receive, that you understand that there's no two thumbprints alike, there's no two blades of grass alike, there's no two snowflakes alike, and God made you for a purpose. And there's something in this church that you must do that no one else can do because God put you here. Pastor can't do it. You're not an uh-oh with God. You're not a mistake with God. You're important to Him. And if we've ever given 110% in this church as leaders, we must do it now. Because this community and this church and the world is dependent. He complimented this church, maybe over complimented your pastor and church, that the Pentecostals look to this church around the world, for example. Oh, God, how much responsibility that puts on us as teammates to help one another. There can be no division as your pastor. If I've ever preached the word of God and it has offended you, then you need to be offended. But as your pastor, if I've ever spoke as Anthony Mangan and offended you, I ask you to forgive me because we all have to be on the same page. And we all have to work together. This book speaks of unity all the way through. United, this church moves. Arm in arm, we move. I don't know of a divisive spirit in this room. I'm so dumb that I believe if I had a 100% vote of leaders, I believe I'd get 100% vote in this room tonight. And I think that's why we have a successful church. But we've got to take what this man has given us and realize that the Lord has us on the other end of his rope and I'm secure and I'm safe and I'm not worried about my salvation but I have a hold of the rope here's the one I'm worried about is when I'm on the mountain and I'm holding it for somebody else here's the biggest problem right here it's not God it's Anthony Mangan it's this old stinking stuff right here here's the problem here's the guy that's no good Paul said, there is nothing good in your flesh. That's why he said, I crucify it every day. And I pray tonight that you take what this man spoke. That was direct from the throne of heaven. And that you understand that you're important in the kingdom of God. And that pastor can't do it by himself. The outreach department can't do it by theirself. The, the music team can't do it by theirself. The children's team can't do it by themselves. The drama team can't do it by itself. The youth can't do it by himself. It's a team effort. And instead of us competing with one another as departments in this church, when you hear the youth has been blessed, when you hear the music has been blessed, and our still may not be blessed, we say, way to go. It's not happening in my department yet, but that's my team. That's my teammate. And with unity, we move. Pastor Terry, would you come dismiss us tonight? Brother and Sister Bailey, thank you for being with us, and I think it would be appropriate to...